Section 20.2, solving the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. Despite the title, we will focus on the rotational energy part of the electron in the hydrogen atom. How do we solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, or any other atoms or molecules, or any other differential equations that contain multiple variables. One strategy is divide and conquer. We try to separate these variables. For example, the wave function of the electron in the hydrogen atom can be expressed as the product of a function of r, a function of theta, and a function of phi. Let's try to separate these three variables. And then we rewrite the Schrodinger equation by replacing every psi with the product of r, theta, and phi. Uppercase r, theta, and phi. And same here. Again, on the left hand side, you have the kinetic energy operator being applied to psi. The potential energy operator being applied to psi. On the right hand side, you have the total energy of the electron multiplied by psi. So now let's separate the rotational energy component. So over here, this is the rotational energy component. Over here, this part depends on theta and phi. On the right hand side, now we have uh, the energy multiplied by the wave function minus uh, this is the potential energy operator being applied to the wave function. And over here, this is part of the kinetic energy. But this part does not really depend on theta or phi. Now we divide both sides of this equation by the wave function of the electron, which is r times theta times phi. Now we get a new equation here. It looks simpler. And also, we realize that on the right hand side, we completely removed the two angular variables, theta and phi. You do not see theta or phi in any of these three terms. Now let's look at the left hand side. Uh, this part is actually the rotational energy of the electron. So we will actually solve this part in this section. All right, so this left hand side divided by the uppercase theta and uppercase phi is equal to the rotation energy. So we multiply both sides by this product. Now we need to further simplify this expression by defining this L squared as negative h bar squared times uh, this complex expression. So what is this L operator? This L operator is the angular momentum operator in quantum mechanics. This L operator is the R operator cross product the P operator the position operator, cross product, the momentum operator, gives you the angular momentum operator for the rotation. So now we just replace this negative h bar squared times this complex expression with L squared. So we have this, all right? Uh, what about the mass times R squared? That's just the moment of inertia of the electron. So we use this symbol I to denote the moment of inertia. 
So we got this equation. Uh, it's pretty difficult to solve this equation, and it's very tedious. So I'm going to pretend that we have solved this equation by ourselves. And now I'm going to show you the result. The result is this. We find the rotational energy of the electron. is L times L plus 1 times h bar squared over 2i. So what is this L? This L has to be an integer. This L is the angular uh, momentum quantum number you have learned in general chemistry and in inorganic chemistry. Again, this L has to be an integer. This L can be from 0 to n minus 1, where n is the principal quantum number. So if you have a s orbital, or p orbital, or d orbital, or f orbital, L is equal to 0, 1, 2, or 3, respectively. So now, what about this uh, L vector? Uh, this L vector is the angular momentum vector uh, in both classical physics and quantum physics. And uh, what about this? I put two vertical bars on the left and right sides of this L. Well, this is just the magnitude of the angular momentum vector. It's equal to, well, by looking at these two equations, Okay, we know the magnitude of the angular momentum vector has got to be the square root of this part. All right, so the square root of L times L plus 1 times h bar squared. So this tells us the magnitude of the angular momentum of the electron is the square root of L times L plus 1 times h bar. h bar is the reduced Planck constant. h bar is roughly 10 to the power of uh, negative 34 joule second. So the angular momentum of the electron in the hydrogen atom is pretty small. Now let's use this equation and this equation to do a few numerical examples. So first, let's calculate the angular momentum of the 1s electron in the hydrogen atom. Uh, this is pretty easy. So this is 1s electron uh, when you are looking at S-type orbitals. 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, L is 0. When L is 0, well, the magnitude of the angular momentum vector has got to be 0. You just plug in 0 here, you know it's going to be 0. So this is really surprising to me. The YS electron in the hydrogen atom does not rotate about the nucleus at all. OK, what about the 2p electron in the hydrogen atom? Well. This is a uh, p auto, so L is 1. And then we can calculate the rotational energy by plugging the value of L. It's just 2 times h bar squared over 2i. All right, so this is quantum mechanics. Uh, it's just uh, h bar squared over i. That's the rotational energy of the 2p electron. And then we can also express the rotation energy as the magnitude of the angular momentum squared over 2i. Actually, this is from classical physics. Quantum mechanics, classical uh, physics. And we can put equal sign in between. 2i and 2i cancel. So really, the magnitude of the angular momentum of the 2p electron is square root of 2 times h bar. Uh, if you plug in the value of h bar, I think the magnitude of the angular momentum of the 2p electron is roughly 1.5 times 10 to the power of negative 34 joule second. 
So again, angular momentum is the position vector cross product, the momentum vector. The unit of the position vector is beta. The unit of the momentum uh, vector is kilogram times meter divided by second. So overall, the unit for the angular momentum should be kilogram times meter squared divided by second. And then you can convert it to joule multiplied by second because one joule is one kilogram times meter squared divided by second squared. Now, what are the possible values of the Z component of the angular momentum of the 2P electron? All right, over here, I want to uh, just let you know the Z component of the angular momentum is simply equal to M sub L times H bar. And in general chemistry, you learn this M sub L can be from negative L to positive L. So for the 2P electron, L is 1. So M sub L can be negative 1, 0, or positive 1. Therefore, the Z component of the angular momentum of the 2P electron is negative H bar, 0, or H bar. Right? Uh, one more example. Uh, let's calculate the angular momentum of the 4D electron in the hydrogen atom. Uh, just pretend that we have excited this electron from the 1s orbital uh, to the uh, 4d orbital. So you're looking at the d orbital, so L is 2, and then the rotational energy is 2 times 3 times h bar squared over 2i. We got this expression from classical mechanics. We know the rotational energy is got to be uh, this uh, angular momentum squared over 2i, so we have equal sign between this quantum mechanics prediction and the classical physics prediction. By looking at this equation, you know the magnitude of the angular momentum of the 4D electron is the square root of 6 times h bar. So you plug in the numbers, I think the uh, result is roughly 2.5 times 10 to the power of negative 34 joule second. All right, so by looking at this equation, uh, you may wonder, can we actually get a value for the rotational energy? Uh, the short answer is no, because uh, we do not know what the value this I have. I is the moment of inertia, I is the mass of the electron times the radius squared. Okay, so we need to know the value of the radius r, the distance between the electron and the nucleus. However, this is quantum mechanics. We do not know the exact value of the distance between the electron and the nucleus. R is a variable. We cannot exactly calculate the rotational energy because of that. Uh, R is, the value of R is probabilistic. This R can be from zero to infinity. All right? However, if you know quantum uh, mechanical postulate four, you understand how to use this postulate, we can calculate the expectation value of the rotational energy of the electron in the hydrogen atom. How do we do that? Well, postulate four tells us if we need to know the expectation value of a physical observable, it's very simple. Uh, we just need to evaluate two integrals. On the bottom, it's just the integral of psi star times psi. Psi is the wave function. Psi star is the complex conjugate of the wave function. 
Uh, detail is the volume element. Uh, the second integral is a bit more complicated. The second integral is almost the same as this integral on the bottom, except that we need to insert the operator in the middle between psi star and psi. So over here, it's not psi star times psi. It's psi star times, well, this part. You need to apply, in this case, the rotational energy operator to psi first, and then multiply by psi star. So maybe I should uh, use a curly parenthesis to emphasize the order of the operations. We need to apply the rotational energy operator to psi first. We get something and then multiply that by psi star. So you just need to evaluate these two integrals and then you will be able to um, get the expectation value of the rotation energy of the electron in the hydrogen atom. Again, this detail is the volume element. If you use x, y, z Cartesian coordinates, detail is simply dx times dy times dz in this polar spherical coordinates, it's uh, r squared times sine theta times dr d theta d phi. It's part of multivariable calculus. If psi is a function of r only, well, we apply this operator to a function of r. What's the result? The result is simply zero because this psi it's a function of R only. It does not depend on theta or phi, so when you, you evaluate this part, it's going to be just zero. And then the rotational energy is zero. So in general, S electrons have zero rotational energy. Uh, what if psi is a function of theta, or psi is a function of theta and phi, and then we need to evaluate these two integrals to get the expectation value of the rotational energy. For example, let's look at the 2pz electron in the hydrogen atom. Uh, the wave function of the 2pz electron is z times e to the power of negative r over 2. Uh, this is unnormalized. Uh, to get the normalized wave function, you need to put a normalization factor in here. Right, but we really do not care about this n because if you look at this expression, if you include the normalization factor n, uh, this n will appear twice on top, twice on the bottom, they cancel anyway. So I'm going to just use the unnormalized wave function here, and z is r times cosine theta, and then we just need to integrate this to integrals. So this is psi, okay, r co times cosine theta times e to the power of negative r over 2 is the wave function of the 2pz orbital, or 2pz electron. Uh, this part is psi star. Psi star is the complex conjugate of psi. To get psi star, you need to replace every single occurrence of i with negative i. However, in this case, psi is a real function. There's no i in psi. Therefore, there's no replacement. Psi star is equal to psi, if psi is real. Now on top, you have this psi star here, and then you apply this uh, um, rotational energy operator to the wave function. Again, uh, just to emphasize that you need to do the rotational energy operation first, I want to put this whole thing into this curly bracket. Alright, so let's uh, simplify this. We see h bar squared on top, the mass of the electron on the bottom, so I just took them out. And if you apply this uh, operator to this wave function, and I think uh, the result is going to be 2 times that wave function. So you get two on top, two on the bottom, they cancel. Oh, uh, what happened to the phi operator? 
uh, in this case, this wave function does not depend on phi. So the second energy, uh, the second um, derivative operator of psi with respect to phi is zero in this case. All right. Okay. Now we got this wave function, and uh, we got this uh, one over r squared here. Uh, do not take this one over r squared out of the integral because uh, this d tau includes dr. So don't do that. Uh, what is d tau? d tau is the volume element. d tau is equal to dx dy dz in the Cartesian coordinates. d tau is r squared times sine theta times dr d theta d phi in the polar coordinates. All right, so we'll just expand this d tau and then realize that although we see theta and phi on top, and also on the bottom, the integrals of theta and phi just cancel. So this is good news. Uh, on top, you see an integral of cosine theta squared, okay, times sine theta times d theta, and you see the same integral uh, of theta on the bottom. On top, you see a integral of uh, d phi. And on the bottom, you also have that integral of d phi, so they also cancel. So it's possible to evaluate the integrals with respect to theta and phi, but we do not have to because they cancel anyway. So on top, you really have this r times this r over uh, 1 over r squared, that's just 1. Uh, this exponential function times this exponential function, it's just e to the power of negative r. Uh, what about this part, r squared? Well, this is because d tau is r squared times sine theta times dr times d theta times d phi. I want to show you that uh, equation again. So you have this r squared here, so I need to put the r squared here. So on the bottom, uh, you have this r squared, r times r, and then there's another r squared inside d tau, so it's going to be r to the power of 4. Uh, how do we integrate this two? Um, I would use uh, Wolfram Alpha, but also I can give you this expression here. Uh, if you integrate e to the power of negative r times r to the power of m uh, from 0 to infinity, the result is m factorial. So on top, you have 2 factorial. On the bottom, you have 4 factorial. So 4 factorial is 24, 2 factorial is 2, therefore the result is just h bar squared over 12 times the mass of the electron. And this is the expectation value of the rotational energy of the 2p electron in the hydrogen atom.